Um, so we'll jump into chapter 23 and finish up that pregnancy growth and development chapter. Um, last time we started out talking about um, process of fertilization and uh, we move through embryonic development, which remember is from the, the point from fertilization through the first eight weeks. And then today we're going to jump into the fetal stage that begins basically with the first day of the ninth week of um, gestation. And let me get in my pages here. Okay, so that is one of the things that you'll notice on your review sheet that you'll need to know is the different dates between the different stages. And so the fetal stage is the beginning of um, the ninth week or ends with the eighth week and it continues on to birth. Um, during this stage, um, growth is really rapid and body proportions change. Um, let me jump ahead to this here. Um, here is an embryo at eight weeks. Um, this is a boy and this is a girl. Um, and you can notice like body proportions compared to an adult um, are very different. And so body proportions change um, during the fetal stage. Um, oops, go back. Um, limbs, the head's going to be really big, as you saw, the limbs are going to be pretty short, um, but that starts to kind of even out um, as you go through that fetal stage. Um, let's see, the upper limbs rem remain fairly short um, until closer to the end of the pregnancy, and about the 12th week or fourth month, um, you can distinguish a fetus between male and female. If you're really um, good with ultrasound, you can do that. Otherwise, um, generally takes closer to 20 weeks of pregnancy to, to determine that, but some people are really good with the ultrasound and can pick that out. Okay, um, one of the videos that you'll watch today for um, your assignment is a fetal development video. So if you want to stop and view that now, it would be a good place to do that. Otherwise, you're welcome to do it at the end. Um, this uh, slide just kind of shows similarities between male and female reproductive structures. Remember the testes and the ovaries descend around the third month of pregnancy to their final, hopefully, to their final destination. Okay, so here's a diagram of the full-term fetus, and full-term is considered 266 days post-fertilization. Okay, that's what would be considered full-term. And here are some of the structures associated with um, the full-term fetus. Okay, so we have um, the uterus, obviously is this big red structure. And attached to the uterus is the placenta. Remember that's that structure that's going to um, pick up nutrients from mom's blood, diffuse them over to baby's blood, and then that will carry those oxygen and nutrient molecules to baby and return them to the placenta and they can exchange there. Um, here's the amnion. The sac there, the fluid inside is called the amniotic fluid or the, um, the water, um, which it's not really water, it's more of, there's water in it, but there's more fluids, more um, substances in there. Um, here's the cervix, which remains closed until birth to hold the baby in place. Um, vaginal canal where baby will exit. Here's the bladder, looks really squished in here, urethra. Um, and then the rectum there. I did um, want to, oh, I'll do that here in just a minute. Um, so here's a really good table to kind of summarize what's going on during these different stages, okay? So this is, again, something you'll want to know. Um, embryonic stage, um, fertilization, excuse me, <sighs> through eighth week. This is the ninth week through birth. Okay, and so some different things going on here. Um, we talked about these last time. Um, mitosis is occurring to get an increase in number of cells. Um, then we form the um, blastocyst, which is 
cons uh, consists of the embryoblast, which is the baby portion, and then also the trophoblast, which is extra cells um, that burrow into the uterus and form the placenta. Um, then you start to get that embryonic disc dividing out into germ layers during gastrulation. Um, then we move into the fetal stage. And again, if you've taken human growth and development or you will take human growth and development, um, those are things you're really gonna probably get into a lot more of than in here. Um, but nerves and muscles start to um, coordinate and mature a little bit early on. You start to get ossification or hardening of the bones. Um, Brody's really growing rapidly, um, muscle movements, fluttering. Um, mom may be able to feel baby's movements um, around the fourth month, fourth or fifth month. Um, and then towards the end in the later trimester, baby's going to put on some fat, gain weight. Um, the digestive and respiratory organs are really going to to be developing at this point and also um, these are going to be the last to mature you know if a, a, a baby is at risk of being born prematurely um, one of the things that they're always very concerned about is the development of the lungs and when we talked about the respiratory system one of the things that we mentioned was the surfactant and that is something that um, very early on babies are not producing in their lungs. And so basically their lungs, the alveoli in their lungs, sorry, <laughs> stick closed. And that surfactant helps them open up and exchange gases. And um, that surfactant is something that those uh, premature babies do not have. Okay, another concept that I want you to be very familiar with is fetal blood circulation. We mentioned a little bit last time how our, um, fetal blood circulation is different from an adult's. And um, so the fetus is going to be dependent upon the placenta for its nutrients and oxygen because it's not eating like an adult would be or an infant. And it's not exchanging gases in the lungs because it's in a fluid filled environment inside of the uterus. So the site of gas and um, nutrients and waste exchange is going to be in the lacunae associated with the, the placenta and the uterine wall, okay? So now remember, fetal blood circulation, when we're talking about the umbilical cord is opposite of what we would think in uh, the systemic circulation of an adult. So we have one umbilical vein, remember, and two, umbilical arteries. Okay, now remember blood vessels that are veins go into the heart. So the umbilical vein is this one here that's going to be oxygen rich, taking that oxygen rich blood from the placenta into um, baby's body. Okay, because remember he's not, he or she is not getting that oxygen or nutrients from the normal organs at least yet. Okay, and then there's two umbilical arteries that are taking deoxygenated blood from baby back into the placenta so mom can get rid of those wastes. Okay, so it's just kind of opposite. The umbilical vein is going into baby's heart. Okay, now besides the umbilical vein, umbilical artery being a little bit different. There's a lot of other uh, differences between fetal blood and adult or even um, childhood blood and circulation or even um, older babies, okay? And so this is something that I want you to pay especially close attention to. And as I talk about these um, concepts, it might be really good for you guys to check out this diagram or look on page 889 um, in your textbook as I'm going through some of these structures so you can visually get a look at them, okay? So um, I'll just leave this slide up and talk you through, well, let me do one thing before we do that. Um, 
so one thing that's different, um, that's not necessarily a structure of the cardiovascular system in the fetus is the hemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin is part of the red blood cells, the erythrocytes, um, that attaches the oxygen. Remember, one red blood cell is made up of um, hemoglobin, and that oxygen or that red blood cell can carry four oxygen molecules. Okay, so um, fetal hemoglobin can carry more oxygen actually than the adult, 20 to 30 percent more, and it has a greater affinity for oxygen than the adult hemoglobin or the more mature hemoglobin. And so um, it grabs onto and hangs onto that hemoglobin a little bit better than an adult. Um, and then here we'll talk about some of the, the structures here of the actual cardiovascular system of the fetus, okay? So the first structure here is we have the placenta, okay, that's attached to the uterine wall. And we have the umbilical vein, this red uh, vessel coming in here, and we can see it coming here. Let me see if I can't, um, oops, totally screwed that up, sorry. Let me see if I can't change my pen color to make this a little bit more um, clear. Here we go. Um, let's do, what color should we do, yellow? Oops. Oh, there we go. All right, so we'll see if this works. Nope, it's still red. Why are you still red? All right, never mind. Try one more thing. Nope, that's not it. Sorry, first day here. There we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, erase, draw. Okay. So we have the umbilical vein. Now I can't. <sighs> Whatever. Okay. We have the umbilical vein coming in right here. Okay. At the liver. Half of the blood coming in from the umbilical vein is going to go to the liver and nourish the liver, get um, passed through the liver. Any of the fats coming over from mom's blood are going to get processed. The glucose from mom's blood coming over is going to get processed. The liver is going to um, be pretty immature, but it's going to kind of start doing its thing, what it would normally do. Then the other half of the blood is going to come through this uh, uh, structure called the ductus venosus, okay? So if we go look here, the ductus venosus is basically um, a place that allows for the blood to bypass the liver and join the inferior vena cava where it's going to mix with um, deoxygenated blood coming from the lower parts of the fetus's body, okay? So we have um, this little area here in the vena cava where uh, we have mixed oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, so it appears purple. And then from the, uh, from the liver, blood is going to travel from the inferior vena cava up into the right atrium, okay? So hopefully this will kind of remind you a little bit of blood flow through the heart um, with a few little bit uh, differences in the fetal heart. So blood will come into the, um, just looking for a larger view of this, blood will come into the um, right atrium from the inferior vena cava. And just like in an adult, in an adult heart, some of the blood will go to the right ventricle 
it will go through the pulmonary trunk and out to the lungs. But remember, baby's lungs are not exchanging gas here because the baby's in the womb is not breathing, okay? So we still need to get some oxygen and nutrients to the lungs so they can continue to grow and develop, but, but we don't need a lot of blood going there, okay? So to make baby more efficient and be able to get that oxygen-rich blood or semi-oxygen-rich blood to the places that need it the most, baby's heart has a little um, structure called the foramen ovale. Okay, the foramen ovale, and this isn't a great image here because it's kind of hard to see, but right here behind the pulmonary trunk, there's a little opening there. And so most of the blood is actually going to go through the foramen ovale and into the left atrium. A little bit, I wish I had a different way of drawing this. A little bit's going to go into the right ventricle, but most of that blood is going to actually just sneak right through the septum there and go straight to the right ventricle, or sorry, uh, the left ventricle from the, oh my gosh, I can't even tell, from the right atrium to the left atrium. Okay, then from the left atrium, it will go to the left ventricle and out the aorta. Okay, so what I would like you to do right now is just stop the video take your finger in your textbook or on your slide and start here with the placenta and follow the blood through name the two structures that we've talked about and um, then kind of look at where the blood's going and then come back okay so once the blood has come across the foramen ovale to the left atrium down the left ventricle it's going to go out through the aortic valve into the aorta Okay, and then it's going to travel down through um, and can actually go up to the head and neck and to the shoulders and to the upper parts of the body or go down into the abdominal aorta, just like in an adult. Okay, now one other way to get some of the blood that was destined to the, go to the lungs to bypass the lungs, because at this point, again, it's not necessary that all the blood goes through the lungs, is this structure called the ductus arteriosus. So remember, blood can come in the right atrium, right ventricle, and out the pulmonary trunk. Okay, yes, some of that blood will go here and some of it will go here, but there's also a little bypass here called the ductus arteriosus and allows some of this blood that came through the, the right ventricle to go directly to the aorta. Okay, so that's another structure that's a little bit different. Okay, and so then um, as the blood travels through the body, goes down the aorta, which is normally in an adult oxygen rich, but it's getting fairly oxygen poor at this point, but if we can tell by the color there. And remember the aorta, the abdominal aorta splits off into the common iliac arteries, and then it goes down um, through the pelvis and into the legs. Well, here, the common iliac artery is going to branch off into the umbilical arteries and take some of that deoxygenated blood with its wastes back to the placenta. Okay, so I want you to definitely be able to understand this. So again, stop the video um, and kind of trace through all of these steps. Now there's also a video that you'll watch for your assignment on fetal blood circulation. So make sure that you take a chance and, and look at that and this might be a good time to do that as well. Um, if you like um, a little different view, of this a little um, kind of more simple if you want to kind of memorize the structures. This lays out fetal blood circulation in a little bit different format if you prefer that. Um, we're going to still start with the placenta, go through the umbilical vein. Remember 50% of the blood coming in and uh, will go to the liver. 50% will bypass The liver and go through the ductus venosus and go straight to the inferior vena cava where it mixes with that deoxygenated blood. 
After the blood goes through the liver, it will still end up in the inferior vena cava. These here just took a short route, shortcut through the ductus venosus. From the inferior vena cava, again, going to the right atrium. Most of that blood is going to go toward the foramen ovale, go through that little opening there and go directly to the left atrium. From the left atrium, going to go to the left ventricle, go out through the aorta, just like in an adult, some of it's going to go to the head and the brain. Others is going to go down through the abdominal aorta. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Um, if the blood does not go through the foramen ovale and it goes from the right atrium to down to the right ventricle, it will go through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, which will go back then to the right atrium, or it could go through the ductus arteriosus, kind of structure there, and go to the aorta directly instead of going through the lungs. Again, um, some of the blood will go to the lower limbs, the digestive organs, and so forth, and can get recirculated back, and that's what's going to mix with the um, blood from the ductus venosus in that inferior vena cava. And then eventually, this deoxygenated blood with wastes in it uh, are going to enter the iliac arteries branched off from the aorta, the abdominal aorta, and then go into the umbilical arteries, which then both, one goes to the right, one goes to the left, and back to the placenta. Okay, so watch that video, think through that, make sure that you understand it. If you have any questions, please um, let me know. Okay, so um, to wrap up fetal, um, circulatory system, blood system, or blood differences, or um, as this slide calls it, adaptations. Here's table 23.3. That might be a good one to check out. Um, again, the hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen. So the hemoglobin is different from what we have as adults or from what um, six-month-old or one-year-old babies have. Okay. Umbilical vein is different. Remember, it carries oxygen-rich blood. Umbilical artery contains um, oxygen-poor blood, and it has wastes, and it's going back to the placenta. The ductus venosus bypasses the liver. The foramen ovale bypasses the lungs and the right ventricle, and the ductus arteriosus um, bypasses the lungs and sends blood straight to the aorta when it's coming out of the right ventricle. Okay. Next part of our chapter gets into mater maternal changes um, in her body um, during pregnancy. Okay, so some changes that's going on with mom's body. Um, so when you take an at-home pregnancy test, again, I think we talked about this last time, the hormone that's detected is HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. And that's what that pregnancy test is going to detect. Okay, if a woman's not pregnant, that hormone's not there. If a woman is pregnant, um, or you know, the first trimester, maybe a little bit in the second trimester, that hormone will be detected. Okay, now HCG that's secreted. Okay, that hormone is going to maintain the corpus luteum. Okay, so think back to chapter 22, remember the corpus luteum is going to be, you have, here's the ovary, you have the follicle with the secondary oocyte in it, you have the um, fimbria and the infundibulum. Um, that follicle is going to be ovulated, okay? And once the secondary oocyte leaves, there's a remnant there, okay? That's the corpus luteum. If mom does not get pregnant, this then becomes the corpus albicans and eventually degenerates and completely disappears. But if pregnancy occurs, um, HCG, that hormone that's gonna be produced by the embryo in the early stages is going to maintain this corpus luteum and this follicle remnant, the corpus luteum, is going to secrete estrogen and progesterone. 
those two hormones. And those two hormones are going to stop FSH and LH production, hormone production, which stops menstruation, stops ovulation, stops that reproductive cycle. Okay, so there's a lot of chemical or hormonal signals that are going on. The, um, the embryo is going to produce HCG, which tells the corpus luteum to not degenerate, to stay around. And then the corpus luteum is going to produce those estrogens and progesterones, which in turn tells the body, stop producing these hormones, which cause ovulation and menstruation. Okay, so put all of that on hold. Okay, so HCG levels, the first couple months is pretty high, and then HCG levels start to drop off as the placenta then takes over producing estrogens and progesterone. So remember, the placenta doesn't form until the fetus implants, and it takes a little while for that to completely develop. And so this corpus luteum is going to produce uh, hormones until the placenta and the, and the embryo until the placenta is ready to produce those hormones um, mainly on its own, okay? Um, estrogen and progesterone are gonna pr promote growth and development and maintenance of that um, uh, uterine wall because we don't want that uterine wall to break down and shed like during menstruation. Okay, so here is um, HCG concentrations, pretty high first couple of months, and then it starts to drop off. And then um, placental, turned over here. Um, estrogen and progesterone are gonna start to continue. Okay, so at this point, HCG is gonna maintain the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum secretes the estrogen and progesterones down in here in the, at this time period. Okay, that's where that's coming from. And then as those levels rise, that's gonna be your placental hormones. Okay, so hormonal um, functions going on during pregnancy. Um, again, the placenta produces progesterone and estrogen, and we call those placental estrogen or placental progesterone. Again, it's going to maintain that lining and prevent menstruation and shedding that uterine lining. Um, as we said, estrogens and progesterone inhibit FSH, follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. And those are going to inhibit uterine contractions, okay? You don't want to have contractions until birth. And so um, estrogen and progesterone are going to prevent the uterus from contracting and expelling that baby, okay? Estrogen and progesterone also enlarge the reproductive organs. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more specifically here in just a second. Another hormone that's produced by the placenta is lactogen. Lactogen, if you think of like lactation, it is a hormone that's going to stimulate breasts, the breast itself, and also mammary gland development. Okay, until a woman gets pregnant, um, her mammary glands, the breasts will have developed obviously, but the mammary glands that actually produce the milk don't start to develop until um, the placental lactogen and some other hormones um, start to stimulate that. Another hormone that's um, produced from the corpus luteum and the placenta is relaxin. And relaxin, as it says, relaxes the pelvic ligaments. It helps loosen things up to get ready for the expansion of the uterus and it, um, basically passage of the fetus through the birth canal and getting it through the pelvis to make sure that there is enough room. It also, relaxin also inhibits uterine contractions. It relaxes that muscle as well. Um, aldosterone, sometimes women um, retain a lot of water when they're pregnant, and so aldosterone will be causing that. Um, and then the parathyroid hormone is going to help maintain blood calcium levels in mom's body so she can shunt some of that calcium over to baby to help with bone development. Okay, so here's just a nice table to kind of summarize those pregnancy hormonal changes. Um, 
the trophoblast, okay, those, remember, embryoblast, trophoblast, oops, trophoblast is the part that <clears throat> attaches to the uterine lining and becomes the placenta. That portion of the embryo produces that HCG. Again, HCG is going to maintain the CL, and then um, it, the, uh, it's also going to secrete, uh, the CL is going to secrete estrogen and progesterone. Placenta will develop. Placental L, uh, estrogens and progesterones stimulate uterine lining, maintains that uterine lining, prevents menstruation or shedding of that uterine lining, inhibits FSH and LH, which prevents basically ovulation and menstruation, prevents that cycling from occurring. Um, estrogen and progesterone from the placenta are going to stimulate mammogram develop, mammary gland development, um, inhibit uterine contractions um, in the case of progesterone, and then estrogens will help enlarge those reproductive organs because the uterus obviously is going to really enlarge during pregnancy. Um, we talked about relaxin, um, lactogen, development of the breasts, aldosterone we talked about, and then also the parathyroid hormone, getting that uh, calcium, uh, maintaining, um, level, maintaining calcium levels in the mom's blood. Okay. So as baby grows, as pregnancy develops and continues on, the uterus is going to get obviously very large. You've all seen um, very pregnant women before, I'm sure. Um, but the uterus is going to start to displace some of those abdominal organs. Um, and the uterus will go up to the ribs. The re uterus will go and push up on the diaphragm. And um, wanted to just show you, I don't have my model to show you, but I wanted to, um, let's see, show you this diagram right here. Um, there's probably some other ones you could Google as well. Um, but normally, so here is almost a full, ter full, full term fetus, okay? Up here, is the diaphragm in this area right here. So you have the liver, the stomach, the small and large intestine, the spleen, all of those internal organs pushed up against the diaphragm, okay? Look how squished the bladder is. The rectum is very squished as well. And so um, baby really takes up a lot of room. Here's another one. Um, you can see the abdominal organs, the um, ascending colon, um, the transverse colon has been cut away. But do you see how all of these things are kind of squished in here? And if you compare that to, let's see, we have another one that's maybe not quite so pregnant. Bear with me just a minute. Sorry, I had this a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a woman that's not pregnant. <laughs> okay, here's the uterus. Look how small it is down here. The bladder is not compressed. The rectum is not compressed here. Um, all of these internal organs, the stomach and so forth, they have plenty of room. And then you look up here, the liver is squished. The stomach is squished. Um, all of these organs are kind of squished to make room for, for the baby. Okay, so let's go back to our slide. Oh, why do you keep coming back here? There we go. Um, so because all of those organs are getting pushed out and displaced by the uterus and the growing baby, um, moms tend to eat um, smaller meals. They may have some reflux where um, the stomach is so squished that that um, esophageal sphincter is pushing fluid back up into the esophagus and causing discomfort there, um, like with heartburn and, and so forth. Urinary uh, frequency, the bladder isn't able to fill as much because it doesn't have as much room. So mom may be using the bathroom more. And also baby is producing some wastes that mom's got to get rid of. And so she may be urinating more as well because of that. Um, so as mom is carrying baby later and later in pregnancy, her blood volume will increase because she's 
you know, exchanging gases and um, basically taking care of baby through her blood supply. Um, her cardiac output and respiratory rate will increase, um, and also urine production, as we said. Um, and so if there is an, in a case where mom is not um, receiving adequate nutrition or maybe not enough food, um, mom's body will become nutrient deficient um, and calorie deficient to, uh, to be able to protect baby and allow baby to continue to grow. So if mom's not eating enough, she may lose weight um, or her, she may remove calcium from her bones to send to baby. And so it's kind of a protective measure. All right, um, so pregnancy continues those 260 days on average. We all know that it can go longer or shorter um, until birth and birth process is called parturition. Okay, so the act of delivering the baby and so forth is called parturition and it's directed by hormones. Okay, so as it gets closer to the time of birth, um, progesterone production from the placenta is going to decrease, okay? As that decreases, prostaglandins, which remember are paracrine secretions, start to increase, and oxytocin production is going to start to increase as well, okay? So secretion of progesterone decreases, and remember, progesterone is going to inhibit uterine contractions. So as progesterone decreases, the inhibiting effect on the uterine contractions lessens. And so you might start getting those Braxton Hicks or those um, kind of false contractions that occur. Um, and so um, decreasing progesterone also inhibits or starts to increase the production of prostaglandins, which is going to initiate labor. Okay, so um, another thing that's going to um, tie into this is a stretching of the uterus and the uterine tissues like the uh, cervix as well um, is going to start to help and that's going to be detected by the hypothalamus and then the hypothalamus is going to direct the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin and oxytocin is what's going to really drive the contractions and the ex expulsion of the fetus. Um, so oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions. Um, and as the, as the uterus contracts and pushes, um, hopefully baby's head down, otherwise it's um, in a breech position, but it's gonna push baby's head um, down onto the cervix. Let me show you this picture. Okay, so as um, contractions occur, these, the muscles of the uterus are going to push baby down and baby's head is going to press against the, the cervix. And during this time, the cervix is going to thin out, which is called effacement, and it's going to dilate and open up as well. Um, let me see if I can find a real quick picture here. Um, Okay, normally the cervix is very thick, okay, and it's closed. During birth or parturition, the cervix is going to thin out. Do you see how thin it is here? Very, very thin here, and it also opens, okay? So they say fully dilated is 10 centimeters, okay? So you want that cervix to thin, and dilate, D-I-L-A-T-E. So those things are gonna be happening as well. And so as the fetal head starts to push on the cervix and stretch the cervix open, the hypothalamus is gonna detect that. And positive feedback mechanisms are going to cause more, as there's more stretch and more pressure there, more oxytocin is produced more stretch, more pressure, oxytocin, and it's like a positive reinforcement, oops, okay? So it's gonna, as we get closer and closer to delivery, the muscles and the contractions are gonna get stronger and stronger and a lot of times closer together until the fetus is expelled.
Um, let's see. Um, contractions also, I was going to mention start at the top of the uterus, the fundus. Um, start at the fundus of the uterus and move downward. So it's going to start at the top and then the, it's going to progress down. So it's kind of like pushing in that type of emotion, trying to get that baby um, into the birth canal and out. Okay, so here's this positive feedback system. Remember, most of our hormonal controls negative feedback, um, but oxytocin and the birth process is one of those that are uh, controlled by positive feedback. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as baby's head is pushed down towards the cervix, the cervix is stretched. The hypothalamus detects that, okay? That is going to ca ca um, cause the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to cause more contractions. The head's going to push down more, and you're going to get that whole cyclical um, process that's going to be going on. So this is a positive feedback situation. Okay, so stages of birth. Um, one of the early stages, and <clears throat> hopefully this occurs and doesn't always, but most of the time, baby's going to get in position to be born. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to be head down, ready to come out head first. Okay, that's going to be the easiest way to deliver the baby. Then <clears throat> the second stage is going to be the dilation and the if effacement of the <clears throat> of the cervix then the next stage is the expulsion of the fetus and then finally the delivery of the placenta that needs to be expelled <clears throat> as well and so after baby is out contractions still occur um, oxytocin is still going to be <clears throat> um, released to get that placenta out and those contractions help minimize uh, bleeding as well. So contractions will continue a little bit even after the placenta is out to minimize bleeding. And also that oxytocin is, not, is going to um, help stimulate nursing. Okay, and eventually the uterus will return to original size. Those contractions um, for a few days afterwards, not continuously, but every now and then there'll be contractions, especially for nursing, um, to get that uterus back down to size and also control any bleeding because you're removing um, that tissue there. Okay, so with milk production, um, <clears throat> that's going to, there's going to be hormonal uh, changes that kind of begin during pregnancy. And so again, remember, placental produced uh, estrogen and progesterones are going to develop those mammary glands and prolactin is going to be produced as well. P placental lactogen is going to help pro promote that mammary gland development. And um, even though this development occurs throughout pregnancy, milk secretion does not begin until after birth. And progesterone and lactogen are going to inhibit that milk production because you don't need milk while the baby is, is still in the uterus. Milk production begins only after birth. Um, and so we have what's called the first milk or the colostrum, which is going to be rich in antibodies. It's very, very thin and it's going to have a lot of fats in it as well. And the colostrum really helps baby transition between um, placenta nutrition and milk. Okay, it's, it's a way for the baby to kind of digest and, and move over. And then what we call mature milk is produced about two or three days after birth. 
Okay. So here's some hormonal control, just kind of uh, a review a little bit. Um, we've talked about these, but after childbirth, um, prolactin is no longer, um, its action is no longer inhibited by these placental hormones. So prolactin had always been produced, but it was, its action was prevented. And so um, prolactin is what causes the breasts to actually produce the milk and um, nursing that stimulation releases ox oxytocin from the brain. And then oxytocin is what causes the release of the milk from the milk ducts, um, or sometimes it's called let down. And so um, prolactin produces, causes the milk to be produced, oxytocin, which also um, caused uterine contractions, oxytocin will release milk from the milk ducts and allow it to leave the breast and, um, and be expressed. Um, let's see. So as long as nursing or um, some sort of stimulation occurs, maybe pumping or, or whatever, prolactin is going to be released and milk production will uh, continue. When um, that stimulation, the nursing, the pumping or whatever stops, then prolactin stops being produced and milk production um, declines and eventually stops. So here's a microscopic view of um, the glandular tissue, the alveoli that produce the milk. And you can see how much more enlarged they are because of those hormones. Um, and then these are little um, droplets of milk um, that the prolactin is, is um, stimulating to be produced. And then when oxytocin is released, that milk is ejected out um, and the baby can then feed. Okay, there's also a video on this as well that you'll be watching. So make sure you check that out. And there are some things that are contraindicated or things that drugs that should not be taken or mom, something mom should not be exposed to when breastfeeding. Um, just like with pregnancy, we talk very uh, little of a little bit about um, some medications and things that can cause birth defects. Um, in micro, we get into that a little bit more. Um, but there's some things that should not be taken when a woman is breastfeeding because it can be transferred through the milk. And so even just regular medications, you have to be careful um, if you're nursing. Um, contraceptives um, can cause some issues with milk production and um, let's see, cocaine. Um, there's a lot of uh, alcohol, heroin, nicotine, PCP, um, a lot of those um, illicit drugs <laughs> um, obviously shouldn't be taken while um, pregnant or um, nursing or anytime really, um, but they can have some serious effects on the baby. Um, phenobarbitrol, which is a sedative, um, all kinds of different things you should be careful of when um, nursing. Um, you can read through this advantages. There's um, enzymes, antibodies, and things like that that can be very helpful to baby. Okay, so after birth, we enter the postnatal period. So prenatal, conception or fertilization to birth, postnatal, um, birth until death, basically. So make sure, again, you know those stages here. Um, so the postnatal period is divided into some of these categories, and you'll need to know those as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about dying as a part of the human life cycle at the end. Okay, again, human growth and development, I'm sure, is much more detailed in these different periods, and this is just kind of a quick overview. Um, the neonatal, so we had um, prenatal, which is in the uterus, postnatal is a period after a baby is born, and then the neonatal is the basic, is basically the first month of life, so birth through the fourth week. Okay, so after baby is born, you know, one of the things um, that causes the most anxiety is when baby is born is, is it going to cry? Is it going to breathe? Is it going to take that first breath? Um, so one of the first things that baby needs to do as soon as it's born is take on that first respiration. And um, that first breath is a powerful breath. They're 
you're going to need to really expand those lungs. Remember, those alveoli <laughs> are collapsed. They need that surfactant. They need a big, powerful breath to open those alveoli and get air in there to exchange oxygen. Um, so some things that are going to stimulate that first breath when baby is first born, um, one thing obviously is temperature. Okay, remember babies in there, nice, nice upper 90 degree area, nice and warm and cuddly and cozy in its environment. So the temperature is going to startle it. Um, the brain is also going to detect, baby's brain is going to detect low oxygen, high CO2 levels. Um, and so that's going to help trigger as well. Um, and so there's a lot of different environmental factors, um, that are going to basically stimulate baby to take that first breath, hopefully. Okay. Surfactant's going to reduce that surface tension and help with that as well. Um, so some other things in that first four weeks that are going to have to happen, they're going to have to figure out how to obtain and digest nutrients. Okay, because mom's been digesting them for them and sending them the glucose and the amino acids and so forth. They're going to start excreting wastes. Um, they're going to start to learn to regulate their body temperature and then also take those cardiovascular adaptations that the fetus has and basically convert those into a more mature system. Um, after baby is born, um, most of the time babies are going to lose weight within the first couple of days because they're using their stored fats um, to get them through until that mature milk is produced on day two or day three after birth. Okay, um, let's see. The colostrum transitions them from um, placenta to milk and they're going to start to secrete to dilute urine. They're going to need to be kept warm, um, blanketed, and, and, um, and so forth, because they're not going to be able to regulate their body temperature quite, especially very, very new babies, quite like an adult or an older baby can do. Um, so cardiovascular changes that are going to happen, um, that umbilical vein, so the, the cord's going to be cut, the umbilical vein that's bringing oxygenated blood into baby's heart, um, or well, eventually into the heart, is going to start to contrit, constrict, and it's going to become a ligament that attaches the umbilicus to the liver. Okay, the ductus venosus, that bypass of the liver, is also going to become a ligament. So I don't remember, I don't need you to remember that's going to be the ligamentous venosum or anything like that. Just remember they become ligaments in general. Okay. The foramen ovale is going to take about um, one year to completely close, but it's going to start closing and fuse shut during um, or after birth, but it takes about a year to completely close. And then and that's the hole between the right and the left atria. Um, the ductus arteriosus is going to constrict in about 15 minutes after birth, and that becomes a, the ligament that holds the aorta and the pulmonary trunk together. I'll show you a picture of that here in a moment. Um, the umbilical arteries are going to also constrict, and they're going to change and become... Um, arteries as well, and also part of it's going to become arteries, part of it's going to become ligaments. Hemoglobin is also going to change. Um, they're going at about four months. They're the hemoglobin is pretty much equivalent to an adult hemoglobin. It's going to reduce its affinity um, from what it was. And also right after birth, hemoglobin numbers drop. And so remember as red blood cells are uh, destroyed and, and recycled, that can produce bilirubin. And so since baby's liver is fairly immature, um, that can lead to jaundice. And it's fairly common for babies to be a little bit jaundiced right after uh, a couple of days after birth as their hemoglobin starts to break down. Okay, so here's just a pictorial view of the changes. The ductus arteriosus becomes a ligament that holds the pulmonary trunk and the aorta together. The foramen ovale is going to close. 
The ductus are, uh, venosus is going to become a ligament. Umbilical vein becomes a ligament. Um, these are gonna become ligaments as well, okay? So those are some of the changes that happen to this cardiovascular system after birth. The next stage um, after the neonatal stage is infancy, which is fourth week for or basically one month to a year. Um, they're really gonna grow a lot and gain weight. So you're gonna see new teeth come in. Um, their nervous and muscular systems are gonna mature. You're gonna go from a baby that can't hold its head up to possibly even be even able to walk. Okay, they're gonna be able to probably crawl, maybe stand um, and grab things. They may start to um, say their first word during that period and um, really just starting to communicate and um, have more muscular and nervous control over their bodies. Childhood is from one year to puberty. And again, in human growth and development, you might talk about toddlerhood and, and so forth in there. Um, but they start to get permanent teeth, start to use the bathroom, um, really start to get some fine and gross motor skills. Um, start to learn, read, write, do critical thinking, um, changing emotions and so forth. In adolescence, um, it's basically puberty to adulthood. Um, this is when a person is gonna become reproductively functional. Remember with the males, testosterone production is basically turned off until this point. Um, ovulation will occur in females and so forth. Um, They'll continue to see growth spurts and develop um, their uh, skeletal and muscular systems. Hormonal control is going to, or hormones are going to continue to mature and um, intellectual abilities and emotional uh, maturity is going to occur as well. And then adulthood <clears throat> is basically the end of adolescence until old age. And <clears throat> For those of you that are young and in your 20s or late teens, um, you are <clears throat> basically at the peak of your physical strength. And then it all goes downhill from there. <laughs> Getting old is not fun. Um, <clears throat> after the age, or by the age of 30, your body becomes 0.8% less efficient. each year okay so <clears throat> the body is going to um, start to notice some uh, elasticity some degenerative changes okay from basically from just things wearing out um, and overuse um, maybe underuse in some situations um, metabolis, metabolism decreases in the 40s. So you may be, you have the same level of activity, you're eating the same thing and you may find yourself gaining weight <laughs> It's because your metabolism slows off. Um, you get wrinkles, you get all kinds of issues in the 50s or maybe even earlier, vision problems, taste buds start to grow, uh, go away, um, muscle mass starts to decline, memory loss, um, height as you get older. Um, one thing that does keep growing though is the cartilage or the cartilaginous structures like the skin or the ears and the nose. So other structures stop growing but your nose and your ears keep getting bigger. Um, yay. Um, let's see, to senescence, okay? That's a term that basically means the process of growing old. Um, you know, again, you're gonna uh, experience uh, degenerative changes and so forth. And, um, you know, we're all going to get to this point, but it's good to study this as well because um, a lot of jobs in healthcare are in um, facilities that take care of older people, okay? Maybe not necessarily a nursing home, but maybe a hospital, uh, a lot of patients that you might see uh, could be older patients. And so it's important to know kind of how their bodies function differently from, <clears throat> from years, depending on what stage you're at. Um, so uh, the body is going to start to kind of break down. Cell division isn't as, as good as it used to be to repair um, 
damaged cells. Um, the immune system can be weakened and loses function over time, as we learned. Um, intellectual sensory functions, um, the central nervous system starts to decline. Uh, coordination starts to decline. Um, you may become more clumsy. Um, homeostasis. The body's ability to maintain that may decline. Um, it's not uncommon for older people to be cold and wear sweaters, um, even when it's a, you know, 72 degrees in a room. Um, and then <clears throat> death usually occurs when there's a severe disturbance to a body system or disease that affects the, the vital organs. Um, so here's a a summary of the stages that we went through. It'd be good to study there. And then in this table, just kind of reviews the different body systems that we've talked about um, this semester and in 201 about how they change as you get older. So that might be good to review those as well. Okay, so the last part of this chapter um, deals with um, the end of life. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and talk about aging um, and lifespan and things like that. And then I'm going to come back. Okay, so let's, let's talk about aging just a little bit and then we'll go back to those other slides. Um, the field of gerontology looks at um, older patients, and it also looks at some of the changes that are going on um, at the molecular level inside of, of a body, at the cellular level, at the personal level, and then also at the population. So what's it looking like in the U.S.? What's it looking like in Colorado versus um, New Jersey and, and things like that? And so um, aging happens kind of passively, and it can happen in an active process as well. And so the difference between those two is passive aging is breakdown of structures and slowing off of things. So it's kind of like passively just breaking down and slowing down and so forth. Um, you know, you get wrinkles in your skin because of elastig elastin and collagen. It's not um, as spry as it used to be when you were younger. Um, DNA replication, copying DNA to help cells divide and repair um, change. Um, biochemically things change. Um, you may have heard of free radicals, okay? In um, some of my other classes when we learn about cellular respiration, we learn that electrons can't just jump off of a, a molecule and go wherever they want. That's not good. When they do that, they're called free radicals. And those molecules start to build up, build up and that's um, what is at the basis of aging. Um, and then there's active aging where you see your body's doing something new that it didn't do before, like developing autoimmunity where it's attacking itself. Or you see a new substance like lipofusion. Um, these are basically waste products that are start, kind of trapped in the body and start to build up. Um, and this active process basically starts before birth. <laughs> you know, you start dying before you're even born. Um, sorry, this is kind of morbid. Um, but apoptosis, programmed cell death, okay, that occurs before birth. You know, we saw it in um, production of the oocytes and, and things like that. Um, in the fetal brain, half of the neurons die um, before birth. Um, and so that it's, it's a process that starts before life and it's normal, um, but it's a, it's a continuous process that we have to kind of deal with. Um, if you're interested in, in people living to be over 100, you can read about that and some of their um, similarities there. Um, and here's a couple of terms that I want you to remember. Lifespan is the length of time a person could possibly live, okay? Somebody, a human, at least at this point, um, in human history is not going to live to be 125, okay? A person could live to be 120, but not really 122, 125, things like that, okay? That's what you, what could be possible. Life expectancy, though, is more of a realistic projection, 
Okay, so when this book was published for humans in the US, uh, women 81 years, men 76 years. That's kind of a, a rough guess. Now we all know people that, that um, live longer and live shorter lives than that, but um, those are um, kind of an expectancy there. Um, when this book was written, there were about 70 people in the world that were over 110 years old, um, and most of them were women. Um, but I just thought that was kind of a neat little factoid there as well. And um, life expectancy has increased over the years, and a lot of that has to do with medical advances and then med advances in um, keeping water clean and keeping sewage separate and, and that kind of thing. Um, back several hundred years ago, um, life expectancy was in the 30s or 40s, um, is about is as long as a person would live. And so um, things were a lot different. We've had a lot of medical advancements that help keep that life expectancy kind of starts creeping up. Okay. Um, so here's uh, 10 leading causes of death, um, and this was as of seven years ago in the United States, heart disease and cancer, the top two. Now, before I go on into the dying part, okay, the end of life, if you um, have recently lost someone or um, just really struggle with death and dying, um, you may definitely be excused from this part. Um, so if, if this is going to cause you um, some mental trauma, um, don't force yourself to go through it. Um, if you're a little bit uncomfortable, though, I would encourage you to kind of um, to go through this process, because even if you don't go into healthcare, you may know someone at some point that um, is facing um, an end of the life, end of life situation. And um, I know for me, it is helpful to kind of know what to expect and to know what is going on during that time, okay? So um, I know this is a very personal thing and it could be very hard for some of you, but I think it's some really good information for everyone to know whether you're going into healthcare or not. So I encourage you, unless it's just, you know, too recent of a loss, um, or just way too hard, I would encourage you to try to at least come get through this. Um, and also when we get done here, there is a video um, of a lady, I'm guessing she was uh, or is with hospice that um, describes some of the um, signs of approaching death in a person that has been chronically ill. And so she does an excellent job of being very empathetic and compassionate. Um, and I just think she does such a good job of explaining some of the signs that you might see as a patient approaches um, death that has been um, proactively dying. Um, so I encourage you to watch that one as well. I will um, uh, leave that one optional, but I highly, highly recommend watching that. Okay, so if, if it's too sensitive for you, you may stop here. Um, if not, um, hopefully everyone uh, else will be able to continue on. Okay, so again, we are talking about someone that is, has had a chronic condition um, that is entering kind of like a hospice type of situation. And we would call this palliative care. Okay, this is not the process someone would go through um, if they're involved in a trauma and it's a very acute short term type of a situation. This is something that uh, where you've known it was coming. Okay, um, so you know, death is part of living, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but as a person approaches the end of their life, um, it is a very personal process. It is extremely um, personalized. It's different for everyone. Um, and it's going to be influenced by their beliefs, their belief system, and also their circumstances. Um, a person who has been chronically ill um, shows um, a, a sequence of events. And I, and I say that lightly because the sequence of, sequence of events um, is going to be different for each person. 
Okay, and they're not necessarily in an order. And some people may um, experience this event and not that event and this one before that one and, and so forth. Um, but there are some things that you can be looking for. Okay, so there's two stages of the dying process. There's preactive and then there's the active stage. Okay, and again, this is for a chronic person uh, or chronically ill person. Um, so the preactive portion may take a couple of months. Um, a lot of times people will be aware that they are dying, that they um, aren't going to get any better and that that is their, um, their fate. And they start to go through the different processes of accepting their mortality. Um, some may lose interest in friends and conversation and food. They may become depressed. Um, because of their, you know, accept, <laughs> going on that journey to accept their mortality. Um, others, like my father-in-law, for example, he um, became invigorated when friends came around. He wanted people to be around him. So it's very different, okay? Some may lose interest in friends. Others may really want to see everyone before they go. They, they may want to be involved in conversations. They, want, they may want that. It just really depends. Um, as the body starts shutting down, they will start to lose interest in food and they may begin to sleep a lot. Um, just because they don't have the energy um, to make keep their body going. Um, and then also swallowing may become difficult. Um, one thing that I want to mention is that as the body starts shutting down, okay, the swallowing reflex will start shutting down. It will become more difficult for them to swallow solo, solid foods. Also, the digestive system may start shutting down as well. Okay, so it's very common for the loved ones to want to continue to feed their, um, their loved one. They want them to keep their strength up and things like that. And um, in some situations, if the patient wants to eat and it's not painful for them, that's great to encourage that. But there may get to be a point where um, the patient can't eat and should not eat. Um, I will tell you about my grandma. Um, she um, did not eat for the last probably four weeks of her life and that was okay because her digestive system shut down and um, they had a caregiver that just insisted on that she would eat and when no one was around she would feed my grandma and kind of make her eat jello and, and different things like that. And then several hours later, after the caregiver would go home, um, my grandma would be in extreme pain because she had food in her system and could not digest it. And so if a person is not wanting to eat, that's okay. Um, the body, um, as we learned in the digestive system, can live for months um, or several weeks anyway, on its reserves, on fat. And so um, don't ever force someone to eat um, at the end of life because, you know, they're dying. Um, and those meals could be painful if their digestive system is shut down and we want them to be comfortable. So they're not going to be hungry. They're not going to have hunger pangs like we do uh, when we get hungry. Um, if they're hungry, they'll tell you. If not, um, don't feel like you're starving them um, because their body just does not need that at that point, okay? So I, I wanted to point that out um, just to let you know. Um, so as you get closer to the active stages, um, this may be um, anywhere from one day to two weeks. And it has some distinct signs. Um, they're gonna be sleeping a lot. Um, they may be confused because their central nervous system isn't working as, um, as acutely as it was. They may not know exactly where they're at or what time or what day it is. Um, again, losing their appetite as the organ systems shut down. And then I put this blank screen in here because I don't have any room here, but I wanted to kind of 
um, just list out a few of the things that you might notice as well. Um, they could become agitated. Okay, they just don't feel good. They know what's coming. Um, could be um, agitated um, in behavior, but they could also, they could um, show agitation in other ways as well, like thrashing. Sorry, <laughs> that says thrashing. Um, they could be picking. Um, they may have a blanket or something that their hands are going to. A lot of times that's an indicator of pain. They may not be able to verbalize it, but if they're thrashing around and, and just not still and peaceful, that could be an indication of pain. Um, the cardiovascular system, um, whoops, can't even spell, will decrease blood pressure, um, uh, function will decrease, blood pressure will decrease, they'll start to get poor circulation. Um, the peripheral areas like the feet and the hands may become mottled. Um, one of the things that um, a caregiver might check for is a pulse in the feet and in the, in the hands. Um, and when that pulse that pulse may disappear. They may not be able to get enough blood pumping, pumping down to the, the feet. Um, the skin may become mottled, which is kind of like a bluish grayish kind of speckled, splotchy, um, or could be just blue due to the lack of oxygen and um, the feet and hands may become very cold because the blood's not circulating there as well. Um, let's see. So some other things that um, show impending death, and, and the video will talk about some of these too, is what we call Cheney-Stokes breathing. C-H-E-Y-N-E, -E, breathing. Um, that's where they're, um, they may breathe, uh, take several breaths, and then uh, you're, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, are they still with us? Um, because there may be long periods between breaths. It may take several breaths and then long, long periods and then take another breath. Um, <clears throat> there'll be shallow mouth breathing. Um, the jaw will relax. Okay, um, they'll lose ability to um, swallow, but the muscles in the jaw will relax as well and their mouth will gape open. Um, let's see, shallow breathing, a slow respiratory rate, maybe only a breath or two per minute. Um, let's see, coughing and swallowing may become difficult. Um, and so forth. And so I'll just let the video um, kind of wrap up that and um, explain a little bit more there. Okay, so um, that is it for chapter 23. We'll talk about chapter 24 next time and then we are done with our material for uh, lecture for this class. Okay, so have a good day and we will be in touch with you a little bit later. Whoops.